All right, apologies there. My computer kind of melted down for a second. So if I said some of this before, I apologize. I'm just gonna make sure we got a clean start on this. Um, the last thing we were looking at was that example of calculating a plane in space. Since the title of the lecture is lines and planes in space, we're gonna move on to the second part of this lecture and talk about lines. But first, we're gonna review what we know about lines in two space. So here's plotted a nice line. I'm naming it L and uh, point is, okay. the names don't matter too much, but point slope form would be y minus one is equal to one half times the quantity x minus one, which is the same as if you algebra that into shape, you can solve for y and get y is equal to one half x plus one half. This line goes through the points. Uh, P0 is one, one and P1 is three, two. So now let's think of using vector addition to get to different points on line L. Remember that vector addition can be thought of geometrically as, as traveling one, oops, let me get a pen, not a highlighter there, as, as starting out and plotting first one vector and then starting our second vector from the tip of that one. And that's kind of a spoiler of how vector equations of lines and space work is you first travel from the origin to a point on the line. And then if you know the direction of the line, you just scale a vector uh, from that terminal point of your initial vector, add on a scaled vector and to move to different points on the line. But that's a lot to say without writing anything down. So let's kind of build up to that. So we're gonna think of vector addition to get to different points on the line L. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get onto the line. We're gonna start by using vector P0. One one will get us onto the line. How do we then move from point P0 to point P1? Well, we can use those two points to calculate a vector in the direction of the line V. V is the vector from point P0 to point P1, and that is 2, 1. Notice that V is in the direction of our line L. So looking at this, how can we get to other points on the line? Well, first you could travel along the vector P0, that'll get us onto the line. And then if we scale V to any length, we can get to any different point on the line we want to. If we scale V in the negative direction, we could get down to this point over there. If we scale V times three times the length, we could land at that point right there on the line. So the vector equation of a line is, uh, we're going to scale t by some arbitrary number, and oftentimes we use t. Uh, so the vector equation of line L is L takes an, that scaling factor, if you will, of t as an, its input is equal to the vector p0 to get onto the line, plus t, our scaling factor, times v, the direction of our line factor, a vector. And here's a link that we can explore. Sorry, that my computer is, I'm asking an awful lot out of a little, little tablet. Okay, so let's uh, drag this over here. You can see over in the left-hand corner of that graph, this line has been labeled L. And what we have is we have a bunch of stuff and I leave it to you to explore it, but it pretty much matches the notation of the what we have on the, uh, on, uh, the other page. But I've got this slider here, A is equal to zero. And the way I have this line plotted is A is equal to zero is gonna be this next thing. So let's see what happens when we move this little guy. Oh, whoops, that's not what I want. Oh yeah. The dueling keyboards here, the built-in GeoDripper keyboard versus the Surface Tablet keyboard. Oops, so. I'm gonna pause for a second. All right, we got it. It's reloaded all as well in the world. All right, so before we look at this graph, there's one more thing I forgot that I wanted to say. So let's bounce back to the slides here. One thing to note is that what does this equation actually output? When you put in some T value here, since we've got that bold notation, what we get is a position vector which navigates to a point on the line. So now let's revisit that graph. 
The way I have the graph set up is if I change this A slider on the left here, where I've got that little play button off to left too, you'll notice it's zero. Well, what is our equation? Our equation is if I put zero in L of zero, I'm going to take Z, uh, V, the direction vector times zero. That means, well, that's just going to get me to P zero. And that's shown and they, we can see that. But what happens when I have one or two as an input? Well, that should scale that vector V and I should travel farther along the line. And I should, for each of those inputs, I should get a position vector, which moves to those, those inputs. Let's go ahead and put play, hit play on this slider here and see what happens. Yeah, as we increase that T value, it moves farther along the line. It always navigates to a point on the line, the resulting vector. And it, what it is, is it's always traveling up to P0 and then adding on a scaled version of V to navigate to any point on the, the line. So for instance, let's see, can I go a little further? There we go. So let me annotate this screen. Let's get the format a nice lot of work. I'm going to use, I don't know, pink here is a good color. The vector equation always takes me up to P0. And then it's going to travel. Well, because A is the input, that's T. I couldn't use T, I used it somewhere else. So this vector here is represented by 2.7 times our V. I've scaled vector V two and a half times. And now you can see that that green position vector that we get as a result of our vector function for this line is in fact the diagonal of the parallelogram formed by adding the vector P0 to some scaled version of vector V. All right, now back to our slides. Okay, so more on lines in space. So what we just looked at, uh, the concepts we explored in two space, expand to three space and beyond, because we've been working in the plane. We actually haven't been working in space for that example. So the vector equation for a line through the point P0 equals X0, Y0, Z0 in the direction of V, which is VX, VY, VZ, is given by L of T, a vector equation outputting a position vector, that first travels onto the line by going to P0, vector P0, and then travels in the direction of the line by some scaled version of V, T times V. And if you put all this together from P0, you get the X0, Y0, Z0 parts of the X, Y, and Z components of our position vector. And then the scaled version of our, our directional line added to each of those components. Here we can let t be from negative infinity to infinity, which will generate the entire line. And if you give a restriction, you can generate a line segment or some other part of the line where L of t, and again, I've said this, but here's formally writing it, L of t outputs a position vector to the point on our line. Uh, from this vector equation of a line, we can just take out the each of the components and get parametric equations for the line. Uh, you know, this is your x coordinate is going to be given by the x component, uh, y, and z, and there's your parametric equations for a line coming straight out of that vector equation. So let's do an example here. We've got p is equal to negative 3, uh, negative 2, um, negative 3, and q is equal to 1, negative 1, 4. These are both points in space. So to get onto our line, we're first going to travel from the origin to point P by using the vector P. Now the direction of the line is going to be PQ. So I know this is a three space and it's hard to draw. Let's just imagine here. Okay, so I've got P here. And so there is vector P. And now over here, up here in space, we've got point Q. Now from P, we could travel in the direction of PQ. And then by scaling that PQ vector, we generate our line in three space. 
So putting it all together, substituting this into the vector equation of a line, we get L of t is equal to the vector p plus t times v, and put all that together, um, negative 3 plus 4t gives us negative 3 plus 4t, 2 plus t times negative 3 gives us 2 minus 3. And last but not least, for our z component, we get negative 3 plus t times 7. And there we go. All right, and there is a plot of our graph, but why not just take a little moment to look at it? Okay, so here it has loaded now, and you can see that we have P and Q floating around in space where they would be, a line through P and Q, and then the red vector PQ traveling along that line. Similar to last time, we can hit play on this A value here, and that will move our position vector along the line uh, as we input different values of T and get and navigate two points on the line. Sorry, it keeps popping back to the generic landing page on this work laptop here. OK, uh, let's take a look at what else we can do with lines and uh, planes in space. Well, we, like I said, we're in applications now, what we can do with this. And one thing we can do is we can take a look at the distance from a point to a line in space. In general, the shortest distance between any two objects in space will always be a orthogonal route kind of as the bird flies. So let's do a little sketch of this. Now, what I'm gonna draw is just floating around in three space. So here we go. Let's say we have, again, point and a line. So let's give ourselves a line. Let's call this line cursive L. And then let's, let's start with a point on that line. I'm gonna say, all right, or rather let's start with a point off the line. I'm going to call this point S. Okay, so now if I want to find the shortest distance between the line, the line and point S, it's going to be an orthogonal route. It's going to be straight and at a right angle. Okay, so how are we going to find this distance? Well, we've uh, we kind of played with the projection of something onto a vector before. So let's say that Hey, we don't know. In general, it's pretty hard to know what that exact point is. But one thing we can do is if we have a line, we can find a point on the line. That's relatively easy given what we know so far. So we start with any point on the line and that allows us to generate a vector from the point on the line to the point in space. So we have point P on the line, vector to point S in space. And now we've got all right, now I can kind of say, okay, now I would be able to, uh, to project this vector down onto the line, but we can also use a similar concept to measure this distance. And so this distance, the distance between point S to line L is equal to um, the magnitude of PS times sine of theta, where theta is the angle here. Now, that's all good and grand, but we, we don't have a way to find um, theta yet. And so that's what we're going to talk about on the next slide. But before we move on to the next slide, we also have to say that, hey, if we know this line, then we know a vector v, which is parallel and runs in the direction of L as well. So v is parallel to L in space. But yeah, like I said, it's hard to find that angle. So let's look at the next slide. So it's difficult to calculate that magnitude of PS and sine of theta in particular because finding theta. So by doing a little trick here and multiplying by a fancy version of one, the magnitude of V over the magnitude of V, which is really just one, relates this expression to a cross product that we can calculate. So by taking our distance D that we're after and the magnitude of the magnitude of PS times sine of theta is the magnitude of all of this stuff. 
And so by multiplying by V over V, right in here, we're sliding in V over V, uh, magnitude of V over magnitude of V. Then this expression on the top is the same thing as PS, the vector PS times, uh, not times, but crossed with the vector V. And since magnitude of the magnitude is gonna really just give you the same thing, we dropped the inner magnitude parentheses, magnitude bars and the final resulting equation there. So let's see, what do we got next? Probably an example of this. So in conclusion, the distance D between point S and a line L containing point P, uh, the line L having direction V is the vector PS crossed with vector V um, scaled by the magnitude. Now I really don't like this. We need the, we need those vertical bars in there. You can't divide vectors. I apologize, everyone. Typo in the way I typeset this. There we go, that makes sense. You, you can scale it down and then you can take the magnitude. All right. Um, it would be better written as this. There we go. Let's settle in on that as the nicest way to write that. Okay, let's do an example here. Say we have the line L of t is equal to one plus v t for the x component, three minus t for the y component, and two t for the z component. Find the distance from point one one five to line L. So we need a point on the uh, point P on the line. And so what we can do is to find any point on the line, you can put any value of T in and L of T will give you a position vector to that, that, um, to that point on that line. So I chose T is equal to zero. And so L of zero gives us the position vector of one, three, zero, telling us that the point one, three, zero is on our line. Now we know P, we know S, two points in space. We can calculate a vector from P to S is zero, negative two, five. And next, the direction of the line, well, that comes from the equation of the line. So the direction of the line are the coefficients in front of T. So here you've got one T, here you've got negative one T, and here you've got two T, giving you, uh, giving us our direction for the vector V, one, negative one, two is necessarily parallel to our line. And just as a little bit of an explanation further as to how that comes, X is equal to X zero, where X zero is the X coordinate of the point on our initial starting point on the line, plus T times VX. And that's why VX is the coefficient in front of the T variable. When I switch the slide, those notations are gone. Uh, so now it's time to find the pieces of the actual thing we're trying to calculate. Uh, I know that's a lot to brush under the table, but take a moment and scratch work it out if you like. PS crossed with V gives us, uh, taking the magnitude of that vector is gonna give us root 30. And next, the magnitude of vector V is root six. And so the distance D between point S and line L is given by substituting in the magnitude of the cross product on the numerator, gives us root 30 in the numerator over the magnitude of the vector V and the denominator root six, root 30 over root six gives us root five. So the distance is root five, somewhere in the neighborhood of two point something. Another application of lines and planes is we can find the intersection of two planes in space. And the intersection of two planes in space will be a line. For instance, you know, kind of visualize this line right here. The intersection of these two planes in space is gonna be this line that continues in both directions. The, just the way it's graphed, it kind of clips off part of the, part of the uh, plane. Oh, yeah clips off the plane. So I've kind of uh, rotated it here to show a little bit better some of the things that we're calculating here. So the first thing we want to do, here's the method is, you want to find a point of intersection of the two planes. Call that point P0. It's a little bit hard to see in the picture, but we've done it. Say we've done it. 
Um, then what you do is you find normal vectors to each plane. And if you look carefully at that picture, you can see that there's a green normal extending from point P0 off of the green plane. And then because the green plane is, is blocking it, it's uh, dotted lines, there is a orange normal coming off P0 on normal to the orange plane. Both normals will be orthogonal to the line of intersection because they're orthogonal to each plane. All right, so uh, here's where actually grabbing the actual graph and dragging it around is gonna be helpful. But just look at the difference between these two slides. If you take the cross product of those two vectors, those two normal vectors as they're shown, what's gonna happen? Well, doing it and then plotting it, we now have this black vector n, which sure as heck looks like it's in the direction of the line of intersection of the planes. So to find a, a vector parallel to the line of the intersection, you take the cross product of the normals to both planes. So the cross product of the normals will be orthogonal to both normals and thus parallel to the line of intersection of the plane. Once you have that, it's now time to talk about the equation of the line of intersection. And we can use the same method we've been using to find equations of lines. So that was the method. Here is an example. So find the line of intersection for the following planes. Plane A is going to be given by the equation 3x minus 6y minus 2z um, equals 15. Plane B is given by 2x plus y minus 2z equals 5. And we're going to follow that 1 through 4 step that we just mentioned there. And so our first step is to find the point of intersections on our planes. So now, here we go. Notice that since our planes are not parallel to the xy plane, z equals 0, in other words, they must cross z equals 0 at some point. And as such, so too must their line of intersection. So we're just going to choose to set z equal to 0 and solve the resulting system of equations. 0 is a nice choice here. It just kind of wipes things out. You could really use this same logic for any z value. But we're just going to choose 0. So substituting in 0 to each of our planes above gives us what we see below. Plane A becomes 3. Uh, well, the equation for plane A becomes 3x minus 6y equals 15 right here. And then the equation for plane B becomes 2x plus y equals 5. Yeah, OK. I'm just checking to make sure that uh, the slides are what I thought they were. OK, so now that's great, but we don't have an actual point on the plane yet. We don't, we haven't, that's not good enough. All we have are these two expressions in X and Y. And so we have to go back to old school algebra to find the uh, equation of the intersection of lines. I couldn't figure out how to typeset this nicely. So what I did was we're going to do this by hand here. And we're going to use the so-called elimination method here. And I'm going to get rid of Y and add them together. And I know that's, that's kind of bad form notationally to multiply the entire equation by six, but I'm just saving myself a little room. No, I, I like it. There we go. Take the second equation, multiply both sides by six. That's going to give us an unchanged first equation, 3x minus 6y is equal to 15. And then you get 6 times 2 is 12x uh, plus 6y is equal to 30, it looks like. That seems reasonable. And then we chose to get rid of the y's. Now, come adding these two equations together, we get 15x equals to uh, 15 and 30 gives me 45. That is going to give us x is equal to 3. Now, in a relatively poor usage of the board here, we're going to go back over here and say, hey, I know x. That's nice. So now I need to find y. And to find y, I take what I know and substitute it back into any equation. I'm going to choose the, the, this equation because, I don't know, y seems to be a little more isolated. So substituting 3 into x gives me 2 times x plus y is equal to 5. And then solving that little guy will give me 6 plus y equals 5, and then y equals negative 1. So now finally, putting this all together, remembering that we started with the z equals 0 means we have all three components. p0, the point on our uh, line of intersection, is x equals to 3, y equals to negative 1, z equals to 0. And the nice thing here is if you find a different uh, point and a different equation, 
the algebra in the same way that finding the equation of a line, you can start with any two points and do the algebra and tidy it up for y equals, and you'll always get the same result. We can always get the same result for equation of a plane too, regardless of the points and uh, parallel vectors that went into it, if we just algebra everything into shape. But that's ahead of where we're at now. So now we got P0. The next step was, uh, a point on the line of our intersection, the next step was to find normals to both planes. And so since the equation of a plane with normal n is equal to a, b, c vector uh, is the form a, x plus b, y plus c equals d, we can just identify them directly. So I will, we'll start with plane a here as an illustration, a, b, c being the normal, the components of the normal vector. a is 3, c is negative 6, and negative two can just be identified directly from the equation of the plane. Similarly, for uh, plane B, two is the X component of the normal, one is the Y component of the normal, and negative two is the Z component of the normal. So that part wasn't too painful. All right, now we got a lot going on here, going on here on this, this uh, page. Well, let's just read it. So the third step was to find a, a vector that's parallel to the line of intersection. Well, we just identified, what we just calculated were those orange and green normals that are kind of shown there. And I, I generated a new plane, which is the kind of grayish plane shown there, that our normals A sub B and B sub B generate. So they span a plane that's orthogonal to each plane A and B and their cross product will necessarily, so the cross product of those two normals will necessarily be parallel to the general direction of the line of intersection since that gray plane is orthogonal to both the green and the orange plane. So now we need to take the cross product of those normals. Taking the cross product of the normals, we get the direction of the line of intersection. So the the V being the direction of the line of intersection is the cross product of the normals of plane A and B is 14 to 15. And so here we go. Last but not least, it's time to put all the information we have together into the equation of the line of intersection. We have the point that we started with, 3, negative 1, 0. We have the direction of the line, 14, 2, 15. And that putting it all together yields the vector equation for our line, L of t is equal to 3 plus 14t for the x component, negative 1 plus 2t for the y component, and 15t for the z component. And while looking at it all on a flat piece of paper is great, let's have a look at the actual graph here in three space using GeoGebra. All right, now that this has now that this has loaded, we've got all of the things we've been talking about. So let's just kind of move this around and look at it a little bit. So if you just look at that orange vector, sure enough, it's normal to the plane, the orange plane. Now focusing on that green vector, you can hopefully see that that is very normal to the green plane. And then vector n is so long it sticks out and extends out of that hollow black tube, which represents the line of intersection there. But we can see that the cross product of these two normals is definitely in the direction of the line of intersection. By plotting this gray plane, remember I claimed that the gray plane generated by the two normals would be orthogonal or perpendicular to both planes. I think we can see that that gray plane is perpendicular to the orange plane here. And then with respect to the green plane, Hopefully I can drag it around and we can see that sure enough, the, the gray and green planes are also orthogonal. And so since the gray plane is orthogonal to both the green and the orange planes, then the normal to the gray plane will be in the direction of the line of intersection there. Looking at it uh, is fine, but this link is live and you're all welcome to explore it. All right, so that's equations of lines of intersections of planes. Another application of lines and planes in space, and what we know so far is that we can find the angle between planes. And so we can find the acute angle between two planes, but first let's review some things that we know. The angle between two vectors is given by the dot product formula, which we can then solve for cosine of theta and then use trig skills to solve for theta. The normal n 
a, is vector ABC is a quote, easy to identify from the equation of a plane in the form AX plus BX, Y plus CZ is equal to D, because you can just look at the coefficients to the variables and have the components to the normal vector. Uh, so what about the angle between two normal vectors? Let's see here. Fact, the angle between two planes is the same as the angle between their normal vectors. And that's shown by this kind of uh, image below, that the angle between the two normal vectors is the same as the angle between the plane. But there's two angles between the two normal vectors, aren't there? There's this acute angle theta that's shown, and then, whoops, I need a pen, not a highlighter. And then there's this, well, red is for not so good things. And then there's this uh, obtuse angle over here. Well, sure enough, it says acute bolded up there. And between two planes, there are always two angles as well. If I were to extend these planes down, I would have um, the acute angle theta shown, but then I would have this obtuse angle there as well. So we're always going to be dealing with the acute angle between the normals. So the angle between the normals is the same as the angle between the planes, as long as you're talking about the acute angles. The distance, as uh, the last application of things we can do, is we can use this to find distances between points and planes. So let Q be a point on any plane with normal n. We've got ourselves a picture there that kind of helps us see that. Sure enough, Q's on the plane. Uh, a point on the plane has normal n. If you know the plane, you know the normal from the equation. Then the distance d uh, to any point p will be the length of the projection qp onto n. Okay, so what does that say? Well, we're used to thinking of projections as, you know, the shadow. If I were to shine a light directly above qp, oh, that was a poor choice of color. We'll use yellow for light. Directly above qp, kind of orthogonally towards n then QP would cast this shadow right there. But notice that is exactly the same distance as what we're after, the distance between point P and our plane. We don't even need to calculate point R at all. We just need to project QP down onto any normal vector representing our plane, the normal vector representing our plane. And the length of that projection will give the distance from a point to a plane. So here's an example. Uh, find the distance from point S equals 1, 1, 3 to plane 3, 2, 6 equals 3x plus 2y plus 6z equals 6. I got so into the mood of normals that I just threw away the rest of the equation and read just the coefficients containing the point P. OK, so what do we need? We need the distance. And be careful here. The notation is actually important, very important here. Uh, the distance here. The distance here is given by, I, I am sorry, I'm stumbling because I'm realizing I should have made a comment on the notation on the prior slide. So let's revisit this and say, hey, all this makes sense. The projection of QP onto vector n is a vector. And so double bars for magnitude of a vector makes sense here. A normal vector is a vector. So double bars for magnitude makes sense, the length of vector n. Now. What is QP dotted with vector QP dotted with vector n? Well, the dot product, remember, is the sum of the components multiplied together. And so you multiply the components and add up them, you're going to get a number. And so the, the, absolute, the single vertical bar here represents the absolute value of that number. And so all the notation and bars are correct here. So now back to our example. Um, Adapting the formula to the situation we have, we would need to find uh, the vector PS, dot that with n, find the absolute value of that, and divide that quantity by the magnitude of vector n. So first things first, so far, why did I call this Q? Yeah, I have no idea. I definitely shouldn't have. Uh, Yeah. All right. So let's uh, let's fix this. All right. So to find a point on the plane. Well, if I'm honest, all I did was look at this equation and be like, ah, oh, three, two, six, and six. 
those are all factors of each other. So I'm just going to put a zero in for x and a zero in for y, or a z. And that means those two are going to be gone. And then to find y, 2 times 3 equals 6, true equation, the point 0, 3, 0 is going to be on my plane. So we'll call that point p to match this up here. So p is 0, 3, 0. Now the vector from our plane to the point s that may is not on our plane is going to be the vector ps. So the vector ps, using all the point we have and s, is going to give us 1, negative 2, um, 3. The normal vector can be identified directly from the equation of the line, or uh, equation of the plane, rather, because, you know, a, whoops, going for highlighter here, not, not pen. 3x component, 2y component, 6z component of the normal vector. So we got all the pieces of the puzzle that fit into our formula here. Now it's time to calculate the numerator and the denominator. And this is the last slide of this one, and I was making lots of mistakes. I don't need the double bars here. This it should just be a single bar because it's the absolute value of a number. The dot product of ps dotted with vector n will give us a number. Absolute value of that number is positive 17. The magnitude of our normal vector is 7. And so the distance, putting it all into the above formula, the numerator of 17, the denominator of 7, um, these kind of absolute bar, value bars are a little bit of overkill there because we've got positive value divided by positive value already. So we're going to have a distance of 17 over 7. And that's our last example for uh, lines and planes in space.